Hey, 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 let's see it. Let's see it. Get it out there. I want to see it a little bit. There it is. Nice, Charlie. I came prepared. Oh, man. I like that. I like and, that. And and this chops this weekend. Two for two. And we got a little, little Wahoo. Yeah, I like that too. I like that. Where are you at right now? Are you in the uh, the boardroom? Yes, conference room. Yeah. Conference room. Guys are are hatching plans to uh, grow the business times ten. Is that is that what's happening there? We got, we got this going on over here. So. Oh, you... top secret. Top Ooh. secret. Might have to blur that out. Yeah. yeah. Oof. But yeah, that's where. Uh, I didn't put a do not disturb thing on the door, so I'm sure someone will come in at some point. <laughs> They're willing. That's all right. So, so are you, you guys are hundred percent moved, right? To yeah. the new facility. Are you guys like overfilled already or what, what uh, you guys. Yeah, we're, we're already what looking. I, what I visited, you guys were pretty dang. So it was a combination of things. So first off, we, um, obviously business has picked up since COVID started. I mean, we got slammed come March, April, May. It's been like, you know, definitely more than usual, but not as crazy as it was, you know, in March, April. Um, but the other thing is like with supply chains, we're getting killed because normally we could order, you know, just for the sake of like 10,000 units. Now we have to buy, you know, a truckload or a, or a container, which is like 30, 40,000 units. So we're having to order huge quantities that we're just not used to. Um, and business has been busy. So we've kind of like outgrown our building. So we're already looking like up the street and in Alaria for storage facilities, just for, you know, for containers and raw products and stuff. Huh. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I guess wow, that yeah, wow. But, yeah. That's wild. That's smart. That's that awesome. is so crazy. Uh so you guys there, you know, the big thing I think you guys learned from the pandemic, Charlie, was like you're saying, supply, supply and chain demands and right. where products and little parts of the product, you know, it's just like you got this bottle, right? Yeah. There's a seal on the bottle, there's a lid on the bottle, all that's, that's not cool. from the same place. Yeah. And what's wild is all your products are made in America. They're made here, but sometimes you got to get stuff from like, let, let's say India, India or China you right. know, to make your American made product. And that was like something that guy told me that blew my mind. Right. Yeah. Talk what you guys have learned about the supply chains. Um, I, I mean, we've learned a lot. I mean, I think the biggest thing is knowing how you can source things uh, in different ways and get, you know, creative, you know, luckily we have someone like Dan, Dan's been, who you know, um, has been awesome at finding different vendors, particularly for wipes. Um, but the other part of it too was like our wipe suppliers that would handle, you know, mid-sized to small-sized businesses like ourselves. I mean, they were just saying, listen, we're getting bought out by a, a Lysol or a Clorox just for capacity. So, I mean, it's like, you can't really prepare for that. Um, and I think even moving forward, you know, if, if our suppliers are getting bought out by the big dogs, there's not a whole lot we can do. So I think if anything, it's just taught us to be a little more agile and um, knowing how to source product, knowing how to source materials. But I mean, it continues to be a challenge. Um, I think it's made us a lot stronger as a company, um, just seeing what's out there and seeing how we can leverage some of our buying power now that we're getting bigger, we're buying larger quantities and you know, hopefully doing big boy business here soon. Are, are you uh, still drinking out of a dirty cup? Uh, yeah, of course. Okay, all right. It's a okay. Yeti. But it's, yeah. Oh, moving on up, right? <laughs> um, so you move new facilities. Um, now you have a little bit of a drive, um, but now you you have the club right in the back yeah. room. I I grew up above my dad's business, you know, small business, right? And you know, one challenge with him is kind of separating, you know, business from, you know, play, whatever it may be. Obviously, you kind of goes hand in hand. But have you learned anything personally? uh you know how to adjust your day and kind of you know how to be efficient when it's you're trying to tackle two things in the same building yeah well so we're so pra we're practically practicing back at ads now oh okay cool, uh, cool. so that's that has changed okay. but no i mean it was just like really long days here i mean especially when we're getting slammed you know i'm coming in at you know 6 30 or 7 o'clock and not leaving until nine at night in the same place um but yeah the commute i mean because I mean, I would, I literally had a, a, a two mile drive to Lakewood because I live in West Park, which is right on the border of Cleveland and Lakewood. I'd have a two mile drive there and then another two mile drive to St. Ed's and then another three mile drive home. So it was awesome. Yeah. Now I got like a 35 mile um, commute, which isn't bad. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's knowing how to separate and just having balance in your life. You know, during wrestling season, you can't have a lot of balance with us because it's just work, you know, work and wrestling season coincide because that's a, a main part of our business. So, you know, we just try to 
you know, in the summer, really trying to enjoy some time off guy, you know, said, I think this is the busiest boating season he's had ever. So, um, you know, it's kind of like feast and fam with us as, as far as personal time is concerned. Um, so I, I think, I think balance is important in doing what you can. Um, but yeah, it, it's been, uh, it's been cool. You know, we're super fortunate, super grateful. And I think a, a large amount of gratitude needs to be, um, kind of reflected on, especially, you know, in today's day and age. Charlie, when you uh, were talking supply chains, you know, you guys, the cylinder, the cylinder that's about the size of probably like a 30 or 40 on cylinder about the size of this Yeti, uh, that cylinder for your wipes, that was a big thing. And you guys almost had to change that whole product line. And then you were sur- able to circle back around and get that, that because Clorox bought it all, Procter & Gamble, whoever the yeah. large parent company, they bought all those. You guys couldn't get them for six plus months, right? Right. What did you guys, guys how are you able to get back? It's um, we actually ended up having both. So we have the regular cylinders that people are used to. We have the new product will actually be, it's like a oval shaped. We're actually Dan's modifying the machine right now. Um, So same product is different, you know, as opposed to the circular, it's like an oval one. And then we came out with these individual wipes too. Um, That was something that we did probably like six, seven years ago, just as a sample thing. And when we couldn't get wipes, I mean, we didn't have wipes for four or five months. Um, Dan was the one that found uh, the supplier, uh, American Flex Pack is a company that we use. Um, but they made the individual wipes for that. So that kind of floated us by until we could get the regular cylinders. And then we got the oval cylinders and then we had the buckets and we found a new supplier for that. So it's been a moving target, which has just been really challenging. But um, like I said, I think we've been agile enough to, to be able to find different suppliers that we really like launching new products on top of all this, man, you're launching products, you're sampling new products, you're doing all the stuff. And it's just like, it's like watching an octopus work, man. Like when I go see, I see Gus, you know, Gus is always back. They're just grinding. When I see Gus guys in the office, you're in the boardroom meeting room that you're in. Okay. You got Dan, Dan's all around. He's like a pinball. You know what I mean? It's like, you guys got all these guys and it's like, you'll pack, you'll pack you'll pack boxes. You'll take yeah. boxes. It's crazy. Everyone's like a utility player there. Like a, it's, it's, I just can't believe how you guys are able to do it with such few employees. Have you had to add more employees? The building, you already outgrown a brand new building, a multi, yeah. uh, I mean, just the unbelievable building. It's just like, how do you guys keep up with it? And how do you have so many utility players? I mean, it's just, we just have an awesome team. Um, you know, outside of all the people that you mentioned, you know, we got, Leah, um, Dan's girlfriend who works here and she's pretty much taken over all the shipping. I mean, and she's just, I mean, just tireless work ethic. We got uh, Brian Timar in there. We have uh, Blake Conti um, and JB. I mean, we just have an awesome team. You know, all these people behind the scenes that aren't really, you know, they're not wrestlers, um, but they're a huge part of our business, which, you know, is a huge part of wrestling for us. So just a really good dedicated work, working team of people that just there, I think the biggest thing is just no one's above anything, you know, like we have people that scrub the toilets. It's just what you have to do. Um, and just having that, that grit. And I know you guys like that word. Um, but just having a, a team that's willing, like, like I said, there's no egos. And I think that's where I think the culture really comes into play is I don't think I've ever heard anyone in the company say, that's not my job. Um, it's just all hands on deck. And sometimes we got to get out of the conference room. I remember, Probably the best example was we, before we had all of our drainage and we had, it was really bad rainfall here and Vermilion gets hammered. Um, and we had like, our building was like literally flooding. Like I'm talking like water coming into the offices and stuff and everyone dropped what they did. You know, everyone had their, their Huck Finn uh, jeans pulled up to their knees and cleaning up water. And it was just like a really, I think it was a really good team building thing because it's just like, Hey, when, when, when a flood happens, it's all hands on deck to try to figure things out. And, and because of that, and, you know, guys kind of steering the ship. Um, it's just a really good culture, a really good uh, team of, of people that like like to work together. So it makes it really easy. Well, probably makes it easy, right? They're majority wrestlers, right? Yeah. And, uh, I, I talk to a guy every year, it seems like the state tournament, with the OEC state tournaments, and he, you know, he sees somebody saying something, right? Something happens with these dads that think they're entitled to something because their kid does well or something. And guy, we have this conversation every year. It's like, you know, everything I have, he's like, I attribute to wrestling. You know, the hard work yeah. I put in, it, it's blessing me back, right? Um, and obviously, this is the barbarian hour. How did you guys cross paths with Josh? Right? He's a he's a small business also, and he does a great job with his his branding and his, his gear. Uh, how did you guys cross paths with uh, with Barbarian? 
So I, I don't I don't know how guy initially I think it was just through like, you know, we would show up to a tournament and Josh had a table next to ours um, kind of thing. It was pretty organic. I've gotten to know Josh really well over the last year. Um, he's just a really good guy. I mean, he's he understands the value of relationships in wrestling. Um, again, no ego kind of guy. I mean, I, I see him at a tournament. I sit down and we and we kind of shoot the breeze for you know two, three hours just because we like wrestling. Um, but he's kind of the same way. I mean, he just he puts in a lot of time and effort into his business and to the wrestling community. And I think he chases relationships and, and things like that rather than chasing money. And I think it, you know, I, I think because of it, the product of that is just, you just have a, a really good guy that people like to do work, you know, business with. And um, he's just, he's just salt of the earth kind of guy, you know, Charlie, uh, my big thing is, you know, I, I think people see you and they see this like really, kind of friendly, happy Italian guy, right? And that's that's what I see. But my thing is, Charlie was a killer on the mat, and we don't really get to talk about Charlie as a killer on the mat. Charlie, you're a West Park, West side of West Park, by the way? Yeah. And is that where you grew up, too? Like, did, yeah. are you in where you grew up? Yeah, I live, like, 100 yards away from where I grew up. Okay, and then, awesome. so your parents, what's crazy is about your family. Your grandfather is Vince Matucci. Correct. Your mom's a Matucci, correct? Correct. Yeah. That's her dad. Okay. So, and then Agazino, it's an Italian name, right? It is. It is. From so you're, are, are you literally are you are you literally 100 percent Italian? I'm 50 percent Sicilian and 50 percent Italian. Now Sicilian. I'm sorry, my bad. My bad. My bad. I, I didn't I didn't mean to merge those. That was my bad. I didn't mean. To, I know that that's very different things, but one hairs, should not be associated with the other. I'm sorry. I, that was my bad. Yeah. Um. But people who, for people who don't know geography, um, Sicily would be the island that the boot of Italy is kicking. Is that right. is that okay? Yeah. Is yeah. that was that a bad was I. Was I not supposed to say it like that or? No, you're, you're good. You're good. Okay. I'm, I'm good. Okay. So I just check it. So you're Sicilian and Italian. I didn't see, I didn't know who's Italian, who's Sicilian. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so my grandparents on my father's side, they were actually off the boat from Sicily. They were, they uh, grew up in Catolica, Sicily, and then they moved to Argentina for about 20 years where a lot of Sicilians kind of moved. And then like two weeks before my dad was born, they, they came to the U S. Wow. So your dad was actually literally born here. Yeah. But, but he would have been born in Argentina. U.S. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So what are all the languages that they, did they speak Italian? They spoke English? Yeah. Spanish, so, what else? So they, like they were kind of raised with English, but um, my, my uncle and my dad, they both obviously knew Italian because their parents spoke Italian. And when they went back to visit, you know, like 30 years later, they're speaking and everyone was laughing at them. Um, everyone in Sicily was laughing at them. And they're like, why, you know, we know our Italian is really bad and, you know, we speak English and they're like, no, you, the way that you guys speak, it's like people haven't spoke like that since, you know, 30 years ago. And it's usually older people because they learn from the older people and obviously the language and the dialect evolved. Um, so that was always the story. They were busting chops that they spoke like, you know, old people, you know, euphemisms and things like that. So, I, so Sicilian and Italian for most people, a lot of people merge and kind of just, put Sicilians in with Italians. I know it's yeah. different. I, I get that. I'm glad that you're able to correct me. So Matucci, Matucci's just, he's Italian, right? That's a hundred percent Italian. Yeah. Your mom's a Matucci. Okay. Correct. So um, we look at it. How, okay. So did you know about Vince Matucci? Cause your grandfather was a state champ in like the forties or forties. Yeah, he was on the 51 West high team, the six state champs and one. And then his brother, older brother, um, was the first three-time state champ in Ohio. So I didn't John really- John Matucci? John? Yeah, John. Is it John? John Correct. Matucci, okay. And he coached at Eastlake then... for years and years too. Um, but like my grandpa didn't really, he didn't really push me into wrestling. My dad, who would never wrestled, um, knew that like, he's like, listen, you're going to be a short, fat Italian kid and you're not going to be good at most sports. So wrestling's probably a good thing. Um, so that's literally how we got into it. It wasn't like, you know- you know, because your grandpa was all this good. It was never really about my grandpa. And then I didn't, you know, I did like, it was real like kiddie stuff. You know, it was just like at the local YMCA. It wasn't, never really took it that serious. You know, I got the kids that I coach now. They're like, oh, would you take a Tulsa or would you take an OAC? I'm like, dude, I didn't even qualify. Like I, I sucked. I wasn't good. Um, we just did like the local CYO stuff. And then like in seventh and eighth grade, I started to take it a little more seriously. But, you know, at least at St. Ed's, you know, most of the kids that filled the lineup at St. Ed's, they were from CYO. You know, I had like, 
you know, Ryan Lang was from St. Albert's and, um, you know, Matt Coe's from Joseph and John. So, I mean, we wrestled at St. Ignatius every weekend in a gym, you know, that was the extent of travel and the sports obviously changed. Um, and now you have travel teams and you have clubs and the sport has evolved a ton. And, you know, the guys now would beat the crap out of us. Um, but yeah, so I got into wrestling that way. And then as I started to get, you know, high school and uh, learned a little more about my, you know, my, my lineage, um, you know, my grandpa was the head of Ohio officials for, you know, 45 years and um, all that, that West high uh, pride that they have. My grandpa always shows me a picture. He's like, you know, they got these guys, they got kids coming from all over the country and they got Russian guys coming in on their teams. He's like, and he has a, a kindergarten picture of four of the state champs. And they all grew up on like the same two blocks. You know, it was the Italian neighborhood um, over at Mount Carmel and stuff. So it's, uh, they take a lot of pride in, in their roots and they're obviously in their Italian heritage. Um, but that's, that was kind of how it all started. So John Heffernan, John Heffernan, Greg Urbis. Okay. And a lot of those other guys, I know uh, Nemeth, Nemeth went to St. Pat's. I know that's another one over there. Uh, What's the elementary that you've, what did you feed in from? So I was St. Pat's too. So I was at St. Mark. You were St. Pat's. Okay. St. Pat's. Yeah. West Park. Um, And and I think is Ryan your age? Is Ryan Nemeth your age? Okay. So Ryan's out in Hollywood personal yeah. trainer he just made a movie did you see that yeah yeah heel it was heel right yeah heel so he yeah, just he, made a movie but always but super talented okay so you get into st ed's you figure out you're a west west park guy and a lot of the st ed's guys are west park guys there's a lot of ignatius people who are west park guys too yeah. but but not quite as much as st ed's that i've with my experience um so you get there and when does it when does it click what, what, when did you figure out John Heffernan's probably one of the greatest room coaches and, and match coaches there is. When did you figure out, okay, I can, I can make the state tournament. I can place in the state tournament. Yeah. Okay. When did you figure all this stuff out? When did you get on the, the gold team? When did you really make the jump at St. Edward? So St. Ed's was like, oh, it's like a huge deal in my family. Like I had, I think it's like something like 27 extended family members go to St. Ed's and only like, you know, five of them have maybe wrestled. So like I'm talking like family parties. If we found out that one of the nephews wanted to go to Ignatius, it would be like literally we'd have like an intervention. Like, so St. Ed's completely outside of wrestling is just a huge part of my family. I'm on a group text with uh, the Manos and the Littons and, you know, all these Italian families that, you know, all related to me. Um, and they all go to St. Ed's. So St. Ed's, I was going to go to St. Ed's if I played tiddlywinks. Um, so the, the school is a really big deal in my family. Um, but, you know, I was like, like I said, I didn't really get serious about the sport until seventh and eighth grade. And I was like, you know, if I do everything in the right way and I, you know, work really hard, you know, maybe just maybe my senior year, I might be able to start at St. Ed's. That was like where I was in the sport. You know, I didn't know that much, um, but, you know, I was willing to put in the time. So freshman year, we were national champs. Um, I was, 90, on the it was 98, uh, 2000. So it would have been 2000. like, I think our first four away classes were Ryan Lang, Mark Mose. Mason Leonard and Mark Jane. So we were awesome. Um, we had a lot of good guys. And then you had Bertine in there and you had Zach Schweda and another state champ. So um, yeah, we were, we were loaded. So it was kind of baptism by fire being in, you know, I was a 12 pounder my, my freshman year. So I was wrestling with those guys and getting, you know, my butt handed to me. Um, and then sophomore year, I ended up getting the starting spot, which is a huge deal for me. Um, I made it to the state tournament. That was a huge deal to me. I lose first round end up winning five in a row and taking third place. So it was like an awesome year. Uh, and then my junior year, I had like, it was kind of an up and down year, but I took third again. And I was like devastated. I'm like, man, this is a waste of a year. So, I mean, it really puts things in perspective. And I always tell people, and Jared can attest to this too at Sandusky, um, St. Mary, is when you're a part of a program like that, it's like anything short of, of perfection or a state title or a national title just like isn't good enough. So Sophomore year, I take third. I'm, you know, on top of the world. The next year, I take third. And I'm like, man, this year was a waste. Um, so going into my senior year, I started to get really serious about college, my goals. Um, Jeff Leonard, I mean, I, I, I'm forever indebted to him. He just spent so much time with me that summer. You know, it was like two, three times a week with him. I was going with Eric Burnett at uh, the Barn 1.0. You know, I was just, just put all of my time and effort after my junior year. And I'm like, I'm going to be a state champ next year. I'm going to do everything the right way. Um, and then, you know, to so start out the year, I, I won Ironman. I won Beast. Um, that was you huge. You won the Ironman and the Beast? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. But that was like, I mean, that was huge. Like for me, like, 
Wow. To win any of those tournaments is a big deal. But for me, it for was just sure. like I was constantly in the shadow of all these awesome guys, you know, the Ryan Langs and the Matt Coses and the Mark Moses. And um, so to have like kind of my, that was like kind of, you know, my coming out party beginning of my senior year. And I had put so much time to get better that time. Um, so I had like a pretty good senior year, ended up losing to, I always say this, the only time I've wrestled in Ohio for St. Ed's where I had the crowd rooting for me was wrestling against Brent Metcalf um, at the Medina. That's the only time in Ohio outside of St. Ed's fans where people are rooting for me. I remember before I went out there, John Heffernan says to me, he's like, hey, you know, this kid has all this hype. But remember, number one, you wrestle for St. Ed's. And number two, you're a senior. He's a sophomore. And I think I actually lost a pretty close match. I think it was like 7-3 or 7-5. And I get off the mat and Heff looks at me and he's like, okay, he's pretty good. <laughs> Who was uh, it? He went on to have, you know, just a stellar career. Um, Who was it? Then my senior year, I didn't win Mac, it. Metcalf. Brent Metcalf. I wrestled against Zach Flake. Um, I was... So many things, like, came. That was, like, such a a seminal moment in my wrestling career because it was, like, I mean, I talked about being a state champ since I was a kid, and I was here, um, and I didn't get there. And it's still, like, still to this day, everyone's like, oh, it'll get easier. And I'm like, no, it still, still hurts. Um so, but again, it's, I think it's, it's made me a much better coach, you know, as far as kids having really high goals and not reaching them and, and knowing how to cope with that, knowing how to, you know, drive it to the next level and, and all of that. So, you know, I was super grateful, super fortunate for the coach that I had, the mentors I had, um, and the sport's been just really, really good to me. So how was the, how the path to Cornell then, how that, you know, transpired? So I had, obviously I had pretty good grades if I'm getting right. <laughs> Like that um i was looking at penn i looked at harvard stanford um princeton columbia uh those were the, the schools that were like really looking at me so it made it really easy i'm like well i can't really make a bad decision here mm -hmm. and cornell was just on the rise um they just bought the, or built the new facility travis leo just won a national title you know we were and then we brought in i think it was like the number three recruiting class uh so that was kind of my trajectory there steve garland who i'm still like dear friends with he was the first guy that called me and the first guy that, you know, they did a home visit and my mom cooked for him. So it was actually, it was Garland and Del Porto, Derek Del Porto, um, two awesome guys that I've just stayed in touch with. So it just felt right. I was just like, these guys are awesome. Um, and then just the coaches I had at Cornell was a, a super awesome time to be there. I mean, we took fourth in the country the one year, but I'm saying the coaches we had, they had, you know, Chris Flieger was there for a year. Uh, we had Jamar Billman, Mitch Clark. So, I mean, I just had, just great coaches, tons of exposure, but, you know, even someone like Clint Wattenberg, I mean, I probably learned more technique and still teach a lot of Clint's technique because he was just such a, such a good technician and so many fine points and just had such a good, um, just a good mind for, for tech, you know, technique and, and developing kids. And, you know, and now he's the, I think he's the head sports nutritionist over at the UFC performance Institute in Vegas. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. So Clint's Clint's awesome. Um, I've stayed in touch with him too. So, Again, I'm just like, when I look at my, kind of my pedigree, I'm just, you know, I look back and I'm very humbled by, you know, I went to St. Ed's, I went to Cornell right on the rise. It's just, I, I mean, that's not something that every kid gets the opportunity to have. So um, when I, you know, when I talk to my kids now, and we put obviously a lot of kids on the D1 stage, but I tell them like, don't take it for granted. I remember coming back from, uh, I think we were working out at uh, St. Ed's for national duels used to be over at Cleveland State. I remember my my college team coming in and looking around, and be like, "This is your high school room." Be like, this is like the Yankee Stadium of of high school rooms. So, you know, I, I think a lot of the times the kids that grow up and it, myself included, you don't realize how good you have it. Um, and I think you know, taking a step back and looking at things objectively, all the things that kids accomplish without that kind of infrastructure is insane to me. Um, and I make sure to, you know, make sure our kids keep things in perspective um, to what to have in front of them, the opportunity. That that infrastructure you just mentioned. Um... You know, like I said, talk to guy obviously a lot, but you guys don't even go to the NCAA's or the high school. Do you go to the high school state tournament? I know guy yeah. says the only time he's been there, right? But I like, you know, they just came out with the next five years of uh, NCAA site locations. And it's like Kansas city where two of my closest friends, the Moore twins are from um, Philadelphia where my other best friend from college is Josh are known uh, Cleveland. And it's just like, ah, oh, dude, we got our next five, you know, reunion mm -hmm. tours mm -hmm. planned. It's just like, guys, I can't, I can't really go there. Um, mm -hmm. because we have OACs, uh, that weekend. So it's like a huge sacrifice, but when they did have them in Cleveland guy and I, 
were just basically like we would go to OAC, we'd come back, try to get a session. You know, I had five kids staying at my house. Um, Chris Vellonga, Jake Arnaud, and a bunch of those guys, Ryan Dunphy, a um, bunch of Cornell guys sleeping on my floor in West Park. Um, but it was just back and forth. But like not being able to go to the NCAA tournament, just it stinks because it's such a, I mean, it's the pinnacle mm -hmm. uh, of, of what wrestling is in the U.S. So, um, yeah, it sucks. But it's that like, infrastructure, right? Guy says the only state tournament he's been at is when Gus wrestled, right? Yeah. He doesn't go because you guys are practicing at West Shore getting ready, right? So he, you yeah. sacrifice, you know, just, you know, those weekends to watch, you know, that's a pretty big stage to be missing too. You know, NCAA yeah. is this, but OHSA state's huge. And Guy is like a cyborg. So he like just, I don't, I don't, he just, he doesn't need, I think he just powers down for a couple hours and then powers back up. <laughs> Because I mean, the stuff that we do, I'm like, dude, we were at a tournament for 17 hours and we have to go to bed and we have to be up in four hours and get back at it. He just doesn't know what, what like to take a break is. And, it, but to be honest, it like really pushes me because number one, I'm too competitive with him where I can't like kind of, you know, wimp out. Um, but the other part, I mean, it just, you know, makes me want to be a better coach, a better professional. Um, so being around him, it's just like, there's no feeling sorry for yourself. It's just like, find a way to get it done keep your mouth shut, head down, power through it. And I think it's made me, you know, much tougher person. Okay. So I'm going to give you a couple chances today. You got to fix a couple of things. You know, we talked at the uh, national middle school duels and I, I'm going to, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I don't want your politician answer. We'll come, we might have to come back to this bar body wash thing. <laughs> I came prepared. Bar body wash, right? I, I don't want your politician answer for bar body wash. I want your, your actual answer. Charlie Agazzino, I don't want the in the but in the okay, morning on that. What what are you? Are you are you a bar or are you a body wash man? What are you? I really am both. Okay, so I never used bars before. I was never a bar guy. And then a body wash guy. So I was I was a body I'm a body wash guy at heart, I'll say. But <laughs> in the morning, okay. so I go, I'm, I'm a That's all I wanted. That's all I wanted. That's all I wanted. I'm a, I'm a, I'm team body wash, but I'm also a bar guy in the morning. You know, I wake up a little groggy, don't have the time. Boom. I'm going straight on after practice. I need to marinate a little bit. Okay. I get the loofah out. I go silicone mitt, put that on and let wow. it sit for a good two minutes. So this is part of this is in the morning is I'm going, I'm, you know, I'm doing this. One. I'm not, I'm not hanging out in it. This it's party time. Okay. That makes sense. Is that, is, that a, is that a good enough answer? That's, a, that's the answer I wanted. That's the real. That's a. That's a. That is a uncut, a raw answer. You gave me some November third, slick politician. Hey, here, hold this for me. All right, I gotta go over here. Bye. You know, you gave me some like bait and switch deal. I was like, that's not what I want. That's not what I wanted. I want. I want. You are. You are at heart. You are a body wash man. You are born and raised body wash man. But I. I okay. So I get the purpose of the bar of stuff though. I get it. Yeah. And the Miller boys are being raised as uh, bar guys, even though I'm, I'm for the most part, a body wash guy. Um, you guys brought me back to the uh, old school bar. I'm a bar guy now because it's what I wash my kids. Back. For real. It, no, it is. Yeah, for sure. And then you're, there's some of your competitors who are hitting it kind of hard. You guys are hitting it hard. And you know, that's guys bread and butter is the, Bar yeah. of soap is, is what made defense soap what it is. No right. question. Um, six dollar promise. Go ahead, Zim. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I read the, the you can read the uh, guarantee on the box, right? Yeah. I don't think it's on the box, it's on the website. The six I mean, that was the cost of Wellington's youth program. And guy, you know, humble beginning said if it was more than six bucks, his parents were like, You can't wrestle. So that's like why that price point is, you know, it has a yeah. sentimental value. Um, and guy, just what he does for wrestling is just insane. Like he doesn't say no. Like I have to sometimes be like, dude, you can't do like, we can't give away everything. everything right. Um, <laughs> and it's just like, I mean, I totally see like for the longest time, I'm like, dude, you just give this, you, you, it's too much giving. Um, but it's also like, that's why he has the relationships that he does too. Like it's so sincere. Um, you know, we had, uh, who was it? Um, Ramos at, uh, Tar Heel Wrestling Club. They had like a, a Rockfin event this weekend and they reached out and Tony was super cool about it. But guys like, listen, we got to support wrestling more than ever. We have to support wrestling. And he's just, it's so sincere. The only like problem I have with it sometimes is that I was like, dude, it's too much. We got to scale back, you know, but 
he's so passionate about it and he's so it's like so sincere it's not like the stuff that he does behind the scenes is tenfold what you know is in people's faces so um i've had to take over some like the the mma and bjj stuff because those guys it's like we'll get emails from people that are like hey my son is six years old and he is an 18 time world champ and we want you to sponsor him so we're going to need some money and it'll be like a, a, a kid on a podium with like him and another kid and then it's, just, it's like well let's put those ones on the side and let's focus on what what actually gets us exposure but it's it's unbelievable what people ask for they just said hey you know we need a, a ten thousand dollar sponsorship for this kid that's a seven years old i'm like it's not gonna happen so, so you're, you're the bad guy right i'm the bad guy so I'm the good cop bad cop you know which is good because the guy was a cop um so yeah so a perfect example right you have defense soap duels coming up you guys don't have to run that right you guys are busy enough as it is right yeah. there's no reason you don't have to run that event you can go wrestle wherever but you guys are you know move locations you're putting that on i mean you're you know gonna have a ton of extra work just to put that on but you're putting an event on just you know for the kids right yeah so i mean we can't really take credit for it because we got bill mazer okay. the mazer family you guys know him, uh, tim mazer's son he's a pretty good mm -hmm. wrestler Mm -hmm. um, but they do so much. Um, and we have like, we just have awesome parents, you know, the team ours and, and um, all the stuff that people do behind the scenes. I mean, they make us look really good. The defense of duels. Yeah. We show up and we do, but I mean, that's Bill's baby and always has been, I mean, the website and the organizing, I mean, I've been working with Bill this year and I'm like, dude, why do you do this? You're a psycho. Why do you like, what's, the... and he's like, well, no, it's good for the kids. And you know, he sees the bigger picture for, for his kid and you know, his teammates, um, but the amount of work that goes into planning, I mean, it's given me such a greater respect, you know, for guys like you at OEC that just have to organize these events. It's, it's insane, the amount of planning and work. And now, you know, you have compliance and masks and um, dealing with the health department. So it's just, it's super tough. Um, so definitely have a, a much greater respect for all that goes into that. Uh, when you look at that facility uh, for Defense Soap Duels this year, you guys had to move from Woodland Gym because Cleveland State's pretty shut down, I believe. But moving from Woodland Gym in Cleveland, Ohio, you know, it's where Guy Russell his home dual meets. I know it's a very dear place to him, but moving the defense of duels to Cedar Point in Sandusky, state-of-the-art facility. Jared's doing an event the week before you, yeah. six days before you. Was it a no-brainer to, to get into that venue at Cedar Point for you guys to do defense of duels, Charlie? Yeah, I mean, I, I, Jared, are you the one that, that hooked us up with them? I'm pretty sure. Like yeah. I don't I mean, recall how it went down. I, but. I, pulled up, I was like, holy crap. Um, so yeah, it's, and, and it's not far from us. It's still in central, like to do anything downtown is probably really tough. I think like things like parking and hotels and restaurants, all that being kind of isolated, not only is it convenient, it's probably a little safer too. You it's know, closer. You're in Vermilion. It's closer than downtown Cleveland, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we got teams coming from all right. Around. Right. Right. You know I mean, so, right. um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. Um, the, the facility itself is insane. I mean, everyone we've worked with there has been like super cool, um, really realistic. They work hand in hand with the health department to keep things safe. Um, so yeah, we're super fortunate that, that Jared hooked us up with them because it's been awesome. And I think that'll be a, a viable venue option for years to come. I mean, it's, it's pretty awesome. I think people are going to be blown away when they see it. Yeah, we need making to get to an event, making an event out of the, uh, the way in. You know, I go and do the weigh-in, and it's like an event, man. Yeah. Like I do interviews at the weigh-in. The weigh-in, they're moving this year, Bill told me. The, the weigh-in's being moved to Vermilion, correct? I think so, yeah. We're going to do weigh-ins here. Um, and then, because, but it's just like, it's, but yeah, that's, I always thought that was awesome. It was like, the kids felt like rock stars, and that's like what it was intended for. And I love that. You know, you see the kids walking, like, with their chest out. You know, they got, they're holding suitcases, like, they got their air lats, because they feel like they're rock stars. But they should. I mean, you should celebrate I remember listening to, um, it was a coach Roper over at UNI and he was talking about, you know, they're asking him, uh, about his perspective on, on youth wrestling. And he's like, anytime you have a kid, that's the best in his sport, no matter what the age group, that's something special. And that's something to be celebrated. You know, he's like, you know, you might have a youth wrestler that's a killer and a state champ, and he might not be that good when he gets older. So you should celebrate, um, their successes early on. And I think that's something that really resonated with me, like, you know, celebrating, youth wrestling in the scheme of things everyone's like ah this doesn't mean anything but like you should still you know gas them up and, and make them feel good because you know it's what keeps kids in the sport you know celebrate their success have you know the, the long-term big picture but i think um stopping and smelling the roses in a sport like wrestling is something you need to do for 
Sure, for sure. I mean, I mean, just look at the the change over the years. I wanted to ask you because you you've come up come up through the CYO program, right? And that, yeah. they're no longer around, and that's kind of what the why the roots of Northeast Ohio are so deep, right? Yeah. Um, do you and Guy ever talk about that? And you know, you guys are entrepreneurs have have a vision um, of how that landscape is changing and where you see it going. Do you kind of see how that's going to so, uh, play out? Like- Pushing the sport forward. I mean, like I said, it's the club model and everything is so much better um, because it allows kids to, you don't put a ceiling on kids. And I think what killed CYO is just like, you know, kind of what happened in some of these other leagues is if you found out that someone so and so missed an event because they wanted to go to Tulsa, then they were, you know, excommunicated from the, uh, the league. And that's just, I think putting, you know, ceilings on kids just turn people off. So I think something like the OAC is, is awesome. Um, I love the OAC because it, it gives the kid a blueprint for success. This is what it looks like. You're preparing the kids, you're um, jacking them up. You're, I mean, it's, it's awesome. The tournament is so good. Um, but I think just making sure that kids enjoy the process, um, enjoy the events, and, and having the ability, you know, for, for your real elite performers are able to go to national tournaments. And we go to, t- I mean, we've been to Maryland, to South Carolina, to Oklahoma. I mean, kids are wrestling um, right now. And I think for some, sometimes it's a little too much too soon. Um, but I think other kids can handle it. And it's just, you know, for me, it's, it's what is dad doing and what are the coaches doing to keep the kid engaged in the sport, um, to keep them just kind of riding the middle line. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, you see some of these, these dad coaches, I'm sure everyone's seen, especially like at Tulsa, it's just like, dude, relax. Like who cares? It's, it's not that big of a deal. Um, so I think like, you know, I think we could say the stakes that are higher earlier on. Um, but we still have plenty of kids that, you know, they wrestle and come the off season, they're playing baseball and football and developing other skill sets and having fun. And, you know, that's kind of where, where my head's at. I think to specialize too early, I think you're doing a disservice to the kid. And I think that's how you burn kids out. Um, you know, I think once you get to junior high, you know, you can focus in a little more, but you know, fourth grader, when a parent comes up to me, he's like, Hey, what does little old John need to be doing this off season? I'm like, he needs to get away from wrestling because you're breathing down his throat every two seconds. So I think giving kids a little more freedom earlier on, and that's just my opinion, mm-hmm. but I think, you know, specializing, you got your whole, you know, uh, we'll say your high school and college career to wrestle where things are really serious and hectic and, and all that. So I think kids should be kids and, you know, not to say that we don't take it seriously. Um, but I think just being a little more well-rounded when you're younger, I think prepares kids for success, you know, later when, you know, it matters more, we'll say. Uh, when you were at Cornell, um, it was right when they were starting to just, just surge, right. It was right. Like you're saying, Lena just won a national title and he was just, Rob Cole was really just starting to pump out the really successful teams, multiple all Americans. You guys took fourth. Uh, when you got there, when did you figure out what your role was going to be there? I asked you the St. Ed's question earlier. When did, you, when did it click at St. Ed's, right? You obviously didn't have the same success at Cornell as you did St. Ed's because it's D1 wrestling and it's so hugely competitive. You're an Ivy League school that's really starting to surge, right? Yeah. When did it, when did it click to you? And I, I, I mean, Charlie, when did you figure out, like, I can, I can make it happen here or, you know, I'm going to get a degree. I'm going to be set up for life. When did you figure out wrestling was important to you and that you guys, that they, what they, what, what his expectations were for you guys to, to build it up? So much right? like an individualized thing. It was just like, you were there or I was there right when, like, you could taste it. Like we were just starting to have national champs. We were just starting to have all Americans. We're like, we're almost there. And I think it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily any one person. It was just everyone could sense that, you know what I mean? It's just like kind of that, you know, you, you sense that blood in the water and it's just like going for the kill. It's just like, we were so close and it just, I think it created such a good atmosphere because everyone knew it's like, we're getting the right guys. We have the right coaches. A big part of it is we have the right alumni and we have the money to do things. Um, but everyone could sense it. And it was really exciting to be a part of that. So I, like I said, I don't think it was me individually saying like, here's what I can contribute. It was just like all hands on deck um, to just push us over the edge. And that's when we took, I think we took fourth in the country that would have been 2000, I want to say six. Um, and we, you know, we had national champs and, and all Americans and it wasn't like a, you know, once in a every 10 year period. I mean, it's, you know, it's become the new normal of having four or five all Americans, having two finalists and having a champ. Um, 
but I think Rob, you know, Rob had been around for years and years and years. And I mean, his commitment to alumni and relationships, in my opinion, is what really took Cornell into, you know, another stratosphere. Um, and I remember, this is one of my favorite stories about Rob is, you know, Rob gets a, a bad rap sometimes. He's a, he's a, you know, a, a fast talker, so to speak, a salesman. Um, but I remember we were doing the, the, the phone-a-thon and, you know, the guy comes in he's giving a spiel. Hey, you got to do this, you know, make your calls five minutes. If no one donates, get off the phone, get on the next. And Rob's like, let me stop right there. If somebody wants to talk to you for an hour and a half and they're alum and they say they're not going to give any money, you sit on the phone, you talk to them for every single second. Like he, he really believed and bought into um, having those relationships with the alum. And I mean, it's never been better. Um, I mean, I, I'm on a group text with, uh, it's the, the name of the group thread is moon rock and the astronauts. Cause our one friend we said is like a moon rock. Cause he weighs everyone down. Um, but it's four of my Cornell wrestling buddies. And, you know, we're always talking about matches. We're talking about the team. And I don't think that's something that Cornell maybe had 20 years ago. It's just like, you have the alums like super engaged with how the guys are doing and nation's down in, um, Virginia tech. And, you know, I mean, we have, you know, all of our teammates, you know, Jordan Leans at, at Pittsburgh, we have Troy Negerson in Northern Colorado, which is, you know, we have a lot of identity with the school because, you know, it did so much for us, but it really keeps us connected to the school. And I think when you have that excitement um, in your alumni, you know, you're willing to donate money, you're willing to, to, to be engaged and, and make a difference. So, you know, it was just, just a really cool time to be there and a really cool atmosphere. So, uh, then how did you come back to obviously you had the connection with the guy, but did you uh, do something in between Cornell and there? And um, what so was I graduated in 2008, um, oh. which was like literally the worst time. And I had a business degree. I have like two jobs lined up in Cleveland. Um, they both called me like, listen, we're laying off 30% of our workforce. So that really sucked. So I was just kind of bouncing around guy hired me. I was working with Jeff Leonard doing construction with an Ivy league degree. I'm like, man, this sucks. Hmm. Um, so I actually moved down to West Virginia for five years um, with one of my college wrestling teammates. We had a business down there, landscaping, outdoor construction. It was called Ivy League Lawns. It's still around. Um, so that was like cutting grass for, for a couple of years. And then we, you know, when we start, started to work on the business rather than in the business, you know, we were doing real stuff. I learned a ton then as far as business and, and how to be, a, you know, entrepreneur. Um, and then actually my father passing is what brought me back to Cleveland. I was working for a career management company. And then I took over at a chain of gyms that my buddy had bought the old Valley total fitnesses still have two locations, but um, I was doing that. I was a chief operating officer there for five years and guy would say, Hey, you know, we're ready to take it to the next level. And he'd always been kind of talking. So they were downsizing guy was upsizing. And that's when, you know, I kind of made the switch. That's awesome. So you guys are definitely growing that that's, but you're still, you know, operating like a small business, like, like we talked, you know, barbarian. Yeah. And I know, um, you know, even, you know, some of the commercials you're putting out are top level. You're working with um, um, New Departure Films and, and yeah, Joey yeah. putting that out there. Um, you know, are there other small businesses you guys work with that, you know, you're, you know, an international company, but you're still small at heart. Are there other businesses you guys work with kind of behind the scenes that are a big um, player in the, in the, in the scene? Yeah, not really. Like, I mean, unfortunately, like you want to do business with local companies, you know, like for instance, we're doing, um, we get all of our, our, not these boxes on the bar soaps, but like on our other products, Sandusky Packaging. Um, I wouldn't say they're a small company, but we always try to do local things. I grew up two blocks from there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So we, were, we were actually just there on Friday picking up boxes. Okay. Um, but so we always try to go local. I wouldn't say that they're a small business. They do some pretty serious business, but um, it just depends. I mean, a lot of the times you want to help younger business, but they're not ready to, you know, to meet your needs yet. Um, but yeah, I, I mean... I think guy will always be really, you know, generous with, with um, younger companies that are trying to make a start or trying to get a foothold in the industry. Um, but, you know, as far as like my experience with being an entrepreneur and all that, it's just a lot of the times you got to be patient um, and you got to develop relationships and it takes time. And I, like I said, when you chase relationships rather than, than business or money, I think, I think, you know, a lot of the times you're more successful that way. Um, so just like planting a lot of seeds early on and then kind of, reaping the rewards of that and being a good person and doing the right things and always giving before you ask for something. Um, I think it pays off in the future. hundred percent. It's uh, like I said, my dad's business the same way. And when you guys were building that, he cut guys like, Hey, give me your dad's number. Like he knew to call him. And 
my brother ended up seeing the facility before I did and he's rubbing it in. Like, I'm like, man, I haven't even seen it yet. And he's like, oh, it's awesome. It's really awesome. I was like, I know, I know. Right. So one, okay, uh, I got, I got a couple more things for him. Um, Jared. Yep. What else you got for him? You got, what else you got for him? I, I want to hear his most underrated product he thinks, or yeah, underrated product you have. Cause I have one in mind. Okay. So give me a second. Okay. So underrated, I'm going antimicrobial okay. skin cleanser. Dude, that saved my finger from a crazy infection this summer. My wife slammed my hand in the door. So, so we own, um, we own the rights on this in combat sports, but this exact same product is sold. Like someone owns the right on pet care. So the dog gets scratched up. I'm spraying this on him. Um, I use it like I spray it like in my shoes because it kills like bacteria and stuff like the the nasty stuff. The that smell, you're right? Um, and then something else. So even though this so this is an FDA registered product, this exact same product, I rip off the label, I file the right registration, I put an EPA registered label. This is actually this will kill COVID on surfaces, but is safe enough safe enough to spray in your eyes. So that's where like it's just the power of hypochlorous acid. Um, people don't know a ton about it, but I think it'll it'll continue to make waves just because of the advances in in um, manufacturing and technology on it. So this kills kills stuff on your skin. So it's FDA registered as an antimicrobial, EPA registered as a disinfectant, and kills COVID. But you can't have you know you can't register a product for both. It doesn't allow you know just the way that the agencies are set up. You can't do it in that way. So it's like super versatile, but I spray it on wrestling shoes. I wear a, a night guard at night, you know, like, so I, cause I grind my teeth like a maniac at night. Um, so when I got to disinfect that, I'll use this. I use this for everything. Wow. Like in, uh, what is it? My big fat Greek wedding, like with the Windex, I put Windex and everything. It's like, <laughs> I've become like an old Italian immigrant <laughs> with this stuff now. I didn't know you could put it on mouth. That's, that's great. Cause you get that mouthpiece and it gets all, I know exactly. Yeah, it, 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 so the other industry that this is sold to is nipple care for, for breastfeeding for mm -hmm. women. So this is safe enough to disinfect and clean um, an area like that and safe enough for a baby to nurse off of it. Wow. So, so my biggest product I like that you guys don't push a lot is the tablets uh, for the cleaning the mats. Oh, uh, we, yeah. We had an incident a few years ago. Um, awesome Matt stats, Matt Maids, whatever you call me to clean a room at St. Mary's during lunch. And uh, something happened where girl was absent new girl jumps in to clean the mats puts way too much soap in i think it was like night before sectionals were starting to work out when someone starts sweating just everyone's slipping everywhere mm -hmm. they were it was a surface was full of soap you know with those tablets there's no you know you hit drop it in you go you go clean right yeah. not, you know, how much do you pour in right i think that's a underestimated product you guys have yeah we're so that's like so we kind of stumbled into that and it's like crushed for us, obviously, oh, because good. it's on the list and all that. Um, but like a lot of programs are using that Ohio State wrestling and I think Ohio State football is using it now. Uh, Michigan State, Michigan. Um, I mean, it's I mean, that that same product, we don't sell it to them, but like the Buffalo Bills use that on all their facility stuff. Um, we had a huge deal with uh, New York City Public Schools. They disinfected all their schools before, right before they opened wow. a couple of months ago. So, I mean, we're we're doing well with that. Um, and again, it's the same. So it's hypochlorous acid. It's the same stuff as this. It's just at a way higher concentration, about five, six times. Um, so, again, it's that that hypochlorous acid is, you know, it's, people are like, oh, it just smells like pool water. And I'm like, well, it's like kind of kind of is because it's a chlorine donor. Um, but it's it's just super versatile. And it's, you know, it's giving people peace of mind and keeping, keeping kids safe. And, you know, it's what they're spraying on the mats at NWCA events and NHSCA and keeping kids safe and, you know, OAC events when those come back. But it's, it's, uh, it's been a lifesaver for us. Save my finger. Save, Save finger. my finger. I, I, I shot a video of it and I never, cause it's like my fingers destroyed and it's all gashed open and bleeding, but I'm spraying that stuff on it. Oh, dude, it was crazy. And that stuff, um, I actually had to go to the emergency room with like this crazy staph infection in my, on my cuticle here. Yeah. Um, and I got this, it was way worse than this middle finger. My wife sl uh, slammed it in the door here. And, it, and I pulled it out as she did it because it hurt so bad. And it ripped it. And oh, man, it laid my nail and everything open. And I just sprayed that stuff on it every day. And it was yeah. amazing, man. Amazing. Actually 
the other thing about it too, and not only is it like a cleaner or a cleanser, I should say, but it, it'll actually help heal wounds. So they were using it during eye surgery because it was safe enough to disinfect and, and kind of or sanitize, clean the eye out. But it also helps the, the skin like become a little more resilient um, and recover and helps like kind of heal wounds faster. So that's like another application of it. So it, originally it was like, so it was really difficult to produce. And I think it had like a, something like a 72 hour shelf life. So it was like a thousand dollars an ounce. It was something ridiculous. And again, advances in manufacturing and technology has allowed it to become more stable where you can sell it like this and have, you know, 18 month shelf life on it. So that's where kind of, it's starting to, you're starting to see it more and more um, because of the versatility and how safe it is and how strong it is and its ability to help, you know, heal and clean wounds. Wow. I love it. It worked for me, man. I, yeah, I, I'm a yeah, believer. It was like, pro- yeah, for sure. Definitely a great product. Uh, can you tell, okay. I gave you a, a second try on the, uh, bar body wash. We gave you try number two on bar body wash. You got it right this time. Okay. Can you get the, can you get Wahoo right this time? Can you get your family lineage to Wahoo? Right. Can you tell so the Wahoo story and how you're a grandpa? I asked my mom. So I sent the video to my grandpa who lives with my mom now he's he's elderly so he needs a little help um but apparently he got commissioned to make it for like 50 bucks um way back when i mean he's been an artist he's done a lot of logos he did one of the michigan state iterations he's done one of the saint ads one of the saint ignatius he was the art director for, for the plane dealer for a number of years um but apparently he's the the founder of it the uh or the original Vince Matucci, drew your grandfather your mom's dad Vince Matucci drew this Chief Wahoo. That's what that's what the claim is. Wow. I don't know. So if your mom said that your mom said that he worked for the plane dealer. They asked him to go from yellow to I this, I, I think it was, wait, or the C. I, I texted you about it, didn't I? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I spelled your name wrong. So. That, uh, you were very disappointed in yourself unnecessarily that I made fun of you for it. Do you remember? You yeah, I was so wrong? sad. My phone what? did it. I can't believe I spelled your name wrong. It's like <laughs> I was that. so bummed out, dude. I go, so bummed out. My best friends that I've known for the last 20 years don't know how to spell my name. And you're like, you were like way too disappointed to the point where I'm like, stop, relax. Okay, dude. Um, bummer. Say, oh, I forget what it was. I had the whole story, but it was, yeah, apparently he got paid $50. <laughs> the, the Cleveland wow. Indians play, paid crazy. Vince Matucci $50 to draw Red Chief Wahoo, your grandfather, who worked at the Cleveland Plain Dealer, they paid him $50 to draw said image on my hat, your hat. That's no longer the team yeah, logo. I, I, it was the logo for 50 years. Let's see if I have it. I sent you the... It was longer than 50 years. Okay, Sorry, okay, it was go. way longer than 50 years. This is a the direct red Wahoo. Logo. So she said, nice interview. Okay, blah, blah. Um, you got the story about Pop Wrong. That is the exact rendition of Chief Wahoo that Pop did for the Indians. They paid him $100 for it about 50 years ago. He did it in the 60s. If you know Pop's drawing style, it is unmistakably his. Be safe. So wow. that's direct from, from Mama Ann's mouth. Wow. That's so awesome. That it like makes me, I gave you a Wahoo. I gave you a stretch one. Yeah. Right. Right. And then I got to get, what do you know? What Are you a seven and a half or seven and five? What are you? I think I'm a, uh, am I a seven and Three or seven and five eights. I think seven and five eights. I got a pretty big head. This is the last one ever. This literally, this hat right here was the last time they ever wore this hat. I almost gave this to you. That's their 2018 postseason I got, hat. I got an all blue uh, 5950, um, but it had the World Series one on the side. I don't well, even no, know. I, I have that hat too. Yeah. I have that hat too, but, but this is. I never wore the the. Blue. Literally, this was the last time they ever wore that hat. It's the last one they ever even made. And then that was when I told you when I started buying them, when MLB.com dumped them for like a buck 99 a piece. That's when I bought like 50 or 60 of them. You should have teamed up with Smitty. Isn't he like a big like closeout guy? <laughs> <laughs> he buys con- uh, rail That's containers like from China. You could, you could go on those like, uh, what are they called? Storage, Storage boards. boards. You would be good at that. Yes. Yeah. Like, dude, I still have a bunch of them. On them? Yeah. Yeah. I, I got to go. For, I do. I still, yeah. Like Jared made the, the name of this was Zubaz pants, starter jackets and Oakley's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have, I have, I have a starter bird and bird and Tom have a starter 
my two sons have a starter Wahoo, like the, the shiny. Oh yeah. They have those two jackets. My son, my mom Everyone found them has. somewhere. I literally have two starter jackets for my kids. Dude, Wahoo on them. They were like every, like I didn't know a single person that didn't have them. They were it, man. It was, it was the best. My brother had a Notre Dame, the fighting Irish guy. You had the, the Charlie, Mike. you had Indians. You had the Indians, Charlie. What one did you have? I was Indians. I was okay. Chief Wahoo. Is that what you have? What, what? Starter, starter jacket when you're younger. Did you have yeah, one? Starter jacket? We were poor. Dude. Oh, Carver. It sucked. <laughs> it sucked. We heated with wood. It sucked. What are you talking about? We didn't have a furnace. I, I'm I just, know. I didn't know if I you have, ever. I didn't have a starter jacket. How about my best friend John had a San Antonio Spurs? Uh, there you go. That's Johnny Watkins. I got to a starter Johnny jacket. Watkins. Johnny Watkins had a Spurs jacket. Uh, I never had a starter jacket. You joking? I, I don't know. I'm just asking. We were poor. It was terrible. Uh, Charlie, that is the last thing. I'll let you off the hook. Okay. Tell me about your magical run at the Southern Scuffle. Oh, gosh. Were it you was, 141 uh, or 149? I, actually, I, lost, I lost to a Northeast Ohio guy in the finals, Nate Goulash. What was the weight? I was a 41 pounder. I was cutting a lot. That was like my second year at 41. It was just, I, I, I wasn't a wrestler. I was just a weight cutter. One of those that years. second year gets you. Dude, it sucked. It was so bad. But um, no, I remember I beat, um, who was it? I think, I don't know if the last name was Owen, Tommy Owen or something. I think that's Tommy Owen from Boise State. No, he was, uh, he was at Minnesota. So yeah, they actually he went, took it. But no, I think, I think Tommy Owen then transferred back to Boise. He's from Spokane, Washington. Is he? He's okay. uh, Roberts coaches with him. Okay. 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 Yeah. So this Roberts like coaches with him. Second or third round. I'm wrestling this kid from Old Dominion that was just like really quick and just talented and way more athletic than me. So I was like down, I think I was down like maybe four or five points after the first period. So I always bust his chops, but Cole just kind of goes like this, just pulls one of these and sits back. I'm like, ah, my kid's going to lose. So the kid takes down and I was pretty good on top. Um, so I turned him like three, four times, third period took top again. And Cole all of a sudden went from here moving up front and getting his hands on his knees real engaged coach and i'm like dude you gave up on me that match and i ended up like beating the crap out of the kid i beat him by 10 or something and then i i had a a good i think it was that that owen kid in the semis i beat him i, I turned him on top i was like so i was really slow on my feet i just like learned how to scramble because my feet were really slow and i got really good on top with the help of jeff leonard giving me the the ryan lang slash lance palmer slash colin palmer boot series so i had a really good coach there um and then i lost to nate goulash in the in the finals where was he from he was a navy he was a walsh okay. Jesuit, but he was a navy oh, so wow was, how bad he beat you magical because i was like i mean i wasn't i didn't have much of a, a college career i was hurt and i wasn't that i always had like jordan lane or mac lunas there so i wasn't wasn't all that successful with national champs ahead of me that'll happen charlie did you never qualified for the NCAAs for Cornell correct would you change a thing about your experience no I would go to Cornell like I mean my best friends are, are from Cornell um and St. Ed's for that matter I still am really tight with my my uh my high school buddies my college buddies you know open a lot of doors for me um you know I could, everyone's like oh you could have worked at defense if you didn't even go to college and I'm like yeah but it's just it's opened a ton for me and obviously you know the education networking um has been top notch I, honestly if i could go back and do it all over i'd do it all the same i don't think i would change anything which is is nice to live like that and how close was your match with uh brent metcalf at medina um i don't know it was a seven i think it was a seven three and then i well, wrestled that's all, that, that was it was that close that's actually oh okay yeah like, i couldn't understand mm -hmm. you guys transitioned in the conversation I didn't understand if it was your state final you lost to a sophomore or it was Brent Metcalf you were talking about. I misunderstood. No, yeah, it was it was Brent Metcalf. It was like seven three, and then I get, apparently he was pissed that he didn't bonus point me, and then I wrestled him at ads and he bonus pointed me. So, yeah. Come on, Charlie. I know that's not my. It wasn't my thing. My only claim to fame, and I anytime everyone anyone brings it up is uh, Jaggers. Jay Jaggers had two high school losses. One of them was to me. Everyone's like, you had him. And I'm like, yeah. And then he won four state titles and two national titles. And he's an incredible coach. So I think he came out on top, guys. What? Uh, okay. What year did you beat him? Was it his junior or senior year? Um, no, I was older than him. So it would have been my junior year, his sophomore year, maybe. Okay. 
And then, and then I, I ended up losing in the finals of that event. I lost to Mike Pasillo in the finals. That's wow. a, You wrestled Jaggers and Pasillo at the same tournament? Yeah. It was the Mayfield what? Big Eight. Oh, my God. Yeah. That was a great tournament. I remember. I remember, like, look, it was a like crazy tournament. Yeah. And then coming full circle, my my best friend in the world um, at Cornell, um, do I, I, I literally talk to him every single day. But he beat Mike Pasillo at the NCAA tournament to All American. He had like a, a wild tournament. Mike, I mean, Mike was super successful in college, right. and he beat Mike. I think he knocked Mike out of the tournament. But that's what put him um, in All American status. It was awesome. That was the only year Mike didn't All American. It was his senior year, and I think his hand something was was jacked up because he was he was really he was really hurt. But who was it? Who knocked him out? It was I don't know if it was in championship or contest. Josh Josh Arnone. He's like one of my friends in the world. Yeah. I, I told him I would give him a shout out somehow. So I found a way to like weave it in there. And he's like, dude, I don't, I don't really care. He's like, what is your <laughs> boyfriend Zeb? Is your boyfriend Zeb? Is that you have a podcast with? That's what he actually said. Oh, is that what he said? It's a, it's we're like that, huh? I don't know. Hey, no, he's, uh, this uh, his brother's Jake out in Colorado, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they're from New York. Or they're from PA. They're from uh, Scranton, PA. Yeah, they're from PA. They've been like, they're from where? They're from where uh, Blue Collar Joe's from, the vice the president, president elect. Yeah, yeah. They're from where Blue Collar Joe's from. So he, what, he grew up in Scranton, but then he is, is he, what's the he Delaware? What's Delaware, yeah. So he can't, like, you know what I mean? And I mean, more probably affectionately known for the birthplace or the, the hometown of Dunder Mifflin. From oh, that's that's sure, yeah. right? The imaginary uh, Dwight, the company of Dwight Schrute. That is, that is. And Michael Scott? Michael Scott. Michael Scott, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Jared, you got any other ones? Jared, you got any other? You got any good youth stories for us? You got a good Heffernan story for us? Anything like that? Um, man. Good guy, Gus. Anything? Not really any stories. I mean, the amount of I'm trying to think of anything good that we've had. Um, any good story? You gotta. I, I need more of a of an inspiration. I don't know. John Heffernan, dude. Are you joking? The white whale, who I finally got to do two interviews with, the man is uh, a, clearly a genius. He lives on the west side of West Park. You're probably neighbors. You probably see the guy out running or doing bear crawls on the sidewalk or something crazy. I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I told him my one of my favorite stories about him was the was the Brent Metcalf story that he was like really. I was like, oh, like, I was right to wrestle in this match. I had the the hometown. Well, I shouldn't say the hometown, but yeah, the Ohio crowd. You know, because Davison would always come up for the Medina tournament, but that was one of my, my favorite stories is that he was like firing me up saying, you're a senior, he's a sophomore. And I came off the mat and he's like, he's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> he's pretty good. Hey, hey, he's pretty good. All right. Metcalf's all right. He's pretty good. So wild. So who else did you butt heads with? Pasillo. Growing up, you'd lost to Pasillo in the finals when he was a little guy. Yeah, you beat Jagger. Did you beat Jaggers in the yeah, semis but, or the quarters? Okay, Jay's watching this. There's something I gotta tell. Him. I wrestled Jay like growing up. I think my record against Jay was probably one in like '83. I mean, he used to just destroy me. I'd be like, I got this kid again. I was like the fat kid that had like the black singlet that was like you know like the women's cut, like came up to here, <laughs> fit everything in there. And Jay would just like torture me, but he was always like the super nicest guy. And his dad was always, and they were like, oh, you're doing, I'm like, dude, I'm getting destroyed. I'm not doing good at all. Um, so and then like, I got to train with Jay and, you know, I, it, he's, you know, obviously just super um, excited for him and all the success he's had in college as a coach, as a wrestler. So, I mean, he's after the one, this is a pretty good story. So we have a meeting with um, Ohio state. This is like uh, not this past season, but the season before. And we're going in talking about the tablets actually. And with, with Ohio State, and you know, it's Tom Ryan and Bo Jordan. And we're all like at this conference room and they got a facilities manager, all this. And Jay walks in late. And uh, this is like two weeks before NCAAs. And Jay walks in, he's got a coffee and he stops and he looks at me and smiles, walks over to me and he goes, puts his hands on my shoulders and he goes, Two weeks before the NCAA tournament, and you guys bring in one of my two high school losses. And so everyone was laughing. And then people were kind of looking like, this guy used to wrestle at your same weight. <laughs> <laughs> that guy, that's the little Italian guy, beard, that guy, yeah. With a Wahoo hat on too, I'm sure. Or wait, I'm guessing when you go to that stuff, you're not Wahoo hat. Yeah, so I do like the, up. 
I do the, uh, I'm trying to do my hair, even though I'm bald thing. You know what I mean? Where you like try to, not really Whatever. a comb over because- Listen, the hair. bald thing, who cares about the bald thing? I don't, I don't who, care at all. Hey, know, listen yeah. to me, listen to me. Hair's overrated. I'm going to tell you guys this much. You, you two who care about hair. He's coming from I just Washington. Had, <laughs> I just had this crazy hair and it was over here and it was stupid. I am so glad that it's gone. Only thing I liked about it is none of it's gray. None of it was great. That's all I cared about. But it was so annoying, and there's all this maintenance. You had to wash it. I don't like any of that, you know, because I'm a bar. Of, I'll do a bar of soap, and I don't care. I don't care. The hair thing's overrated. Being bald would I? It would be a gift for me. At this I, point. I, I don't mind it. I don't mind. I'm, I'm glad. I look back and I'm like, I look like an idiot with hair. I'm glad it fell. Out. My hair is horrible. Did you I see the first two shows? I can't do the full shave job. I can't no, do it. No, we I just, did, yeah. We it. wrestled Blair Academy my senior year. I remember this is like another really cool. So um, now that was, that was the grand match. Okay. No. So for the Blair match, we're all like this for the national championship. We're all going to shave our heads. So we shaved my head, our heads and I did not look good. So people were like, wow, you should not have done that. You like my head just is not, it's just kind of like, I got like a stegosaurus thing going down the center. <laughs> but luckily, I have a really good, really good hairstylist. Shout out uh, Mel's place. That's my that's my girl there, Brittany. What West Park? Uh yeah, real close to it. Westwood Town. Of course. Of course, right? Yeah. I think hey it's Charlie. Mel's, Mel's Charlie. I, what is it? She told me she gave me, she said, when it's time to to pull the plug for real, I'll tell you. So that's okay. uh that's my shout out. Okay. I gotta just tell you the thing I remember about you. You used to come to Burnett's. I don't know if you remember, I always worked at Burnett's. You remember that? Yeah. Not real. I, I was young, man. This is like we're talking like twenty years ago. Your dad was always with you, and your dad was like a really good dude, right? And your dad was just like whatever it took to get. I remember he always had like this little little guy with him, little uh, Iranian, Italian. I don't know what you wear. I was like, well, I don't know what this guy is. I, I I can't tell if he's a Turkish dude. I couldn't tell. You looked like a very ethnic guy. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because it was when I was. Well, two things, and well, I'll, before I won't get too deep into it. When I was real little, I was real tan, and people would be like, "Who's what's happening with your what's what's going on with Raul over here?" I had like a mustache when I was. In I third. didn't say that. I didn't say that. But like, that's there, and that was like that's what the 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 chatter was about. Yeah, my there, boss, yeah. my boss is a Greek guy. He tells me that people mistake him for like literally every ethnicity on like this very broad spectrum. And I remember you as like a kid and your dad always brought you. Yeah, how, yeah. Clo how close were you and your dad, man? It seemed like you and your dad like spent so much time together and it seemed yeah, like it, it was, was really um, a big part of your wrestling. Like with Eric too. It's just like he, I, I honestly, like I'd say like all of my success could be attributed to him. Cause he just like, didn't give up. I'm like, we would draw, I mean, the stuff, the amount of time that he would put into it, and like we'd show up to a tournament, I just go, Oh, and two. And I'd be like, all right, do you want to quit wrestling? He's like, no, all right, Eric, we're going to keep training. And like someone like Eric that just never gave up on me um, and guys like Jeff Leonard that never gave up on me. Um, but my dad was always the driving force behind that. I mean, he did it, like literally everything. The amount of sacrifice that he made for, for my brother, for myself, for my family. I mean, he would do like everything was about me. It was just like, we need to do this to, you know, make sure that he's getting access to good coaches and we got to go to tournaments and you know, some of my really tough memories of getting pushed, you know, were him, but you know, all of my success, I look back and I'm like, holy crap. Um, it's just, it's the, what parents, dads, moms, families do for their kids. It's, it's insane. It's insane. It wasn't just a sacrifice. Well, Char's cutting weight. It's like, well, mom, you know, has to cook healthy now and everyone has to eat. Like it's, it, it takes a, a family. It takes a community to build a state champ. And like my family was, man, they were all in, you know, I mean, I always say wrestling sisters are they're like the unsung heroes of wrestling of families, because like, you see a sister like, oh, who's this? It's like, oh, this is our daughter. It's like, I've known you for 25 years. I didn't know you had a daughter because you keep her locked away on all these trips that you guys go on. So it's, it's tough. So shout out to my sister too, for dealing with my brother and I all these years. Um, when did your dad pass away? It was like eight years ago. Eight years ago, he was just like the dude. Your dad was a salt of the earth. He was such a good dude, man. Yeah, Not really, like always, just a friendly guy, easy to talk to. And like his, so his uh, his wake was really therapeutic for me because it was supposed to be like 
you know, normal viewing hours, like three hours, take a one hour break, three hours. It was like 12 hours straight. Um, it was just like, it was a three hour wait. And it was like such a, I mean, it was very therapeutic, but it was such a, um, like a testament. Like, I mean, talk about like a commemoration of, of someone's life. I mean, I had Derek Del Porto bought a, brought a bunch of the Eastern Michigan guys at Russell Forum and, and people waiting in line for three hours. I mean, it was like, it was so overwhelming and like in the most positive way and seeing, you know, you see someone's whole life, you know, I worked with them 30 years ago at Fazio's when he was the produce manager or, you know, but even I remember talking to Eric Burnett, um, obviously all my San Jose coaches, I remember I talked, I, I drove home. I found out um, in West Virginia, I got in a car, I drove home and it was like, you know, it's, that's a tough drive. And I remember talking to Jeff Leonard for like an hour and he'd like, you know, walk me through all this, you know, what I had to do and what he meant to, you know, him and all that stuff. Um, but I remember talking to Eric Burnett and, you know, all the stuff that he had to say about him. I talked to, to Dave Riggs. I saw him at the Medina. He gave, like, I was always competing super hard against Dave. Like I was wrestling against him. Ah, I don't like this guy from Mass and Perry. He wants to beat us. And then I remember seeing him at the Medina and he like just wrapped his, I didn't know him that well. And he just wrapped his arms around me and like talked about my dad. And it was like super flattering. I'm like, holy crap, you know, it puts things in perspective. And now I get to coach with Dave. So I always, you know, when I first started to get close with him, I was like, I've never forgotten that. Um, so when it happens, it's like, everything's a blur and you kind of, you know, focus on, um, a couple things that stick out, but, you know, guys that I coached against, um, and wrestled against, you know, Eric, who's done a ton for me, Dave who's done a ton for me, you know, Urbis and Jeff and, and John, it's just been, you know, I'm super blessed to have the people in my life that I did, you know, when I needed them. So it was, it was tough. Everybody loves Charlie and you can see why, because everybody loved Charlie's dad and you can see yeah. why mm, thank it's you. like guys are easy going you're easy to talk to it's just yeah i mean it's just it's a great way to live your life how about that it's a, yeah. I mean, if you've, we if got, you've learned yeah. one thing it's a great way to live your life yeah yeah and i think like so when it happened to my um my sister was pregnant with her first and he got named after my dad and my brother who i so i just have a new nephew now they got born six weeks ago my brother had covid so he was locked in the basement so i saw my um my nephew for the first time this past Saturday and he's named after my uncle. My uncle has been, you know, a godsend, you know, about my dad and just, just being like, you know, the kind of a surrogate father to all of us, you know, we're all adults and, you know, there's times where you just need, you know, need someone. And he's always been that guy for us. So it's been, um, it's been a blessing. Everything's been a blessing. That's awesome. That's good to hear, man. It's good that you six week old nephew. Yeah. Leo. Leo Agazino. And my <laughs> uncle's name, my uncle's legal name, believe it or not, was just for retired. So, okay, last story, I promise. Um, so my uncle Leo was the, um, he, were, he was a partner of Jones Day for years and years, just retired two years ago. He was on Art Modell's defense team and he was like a Cleveland Brown season ticket holder for years. So he was like, it was like tough. It was really difficult on him. And my dad being the ball blaster that he was who worked for the plane dealer. So I remember it was like Christmas or Thanksgiving. And my dad had like a, a stack of 30 papers and it was a sign and it said like, <laughs> like autograph with the trader because it was like a picture of Art Modell's team. And it like was the back of my uncle's bald head, which you wouldn't know it was him unless you knew him. So my dad brought a stack of newspapers and had a sign saying you could get a newspaper signed by the trader, which was my uncle. So he was like such a ball buster. So then my uncle um, retires from Jones Day and gets onto the Cleveland Indians grounds crew. That's what he's been doing the last year. And he's he's loving it. It's awesome. So he the like tarp guys, the tarp What's guys it? and the and the mound guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. So he that was like his so it's been it's been awesome. He's been like such a, a big part of our lives. Um, always has been, but you know, has really stepped in. Um, it's just like a just an awesome guy. That's so, awesome. okay. Your, your, your grandpa worked for the plane dealer and your dad. Yeah. Yeah. Is that my how your mom and your dad met? Dad like in uh, like distribution and stuff. And that's, I mean, was that, that was like near the end of my dad's um, work at like plane dealer. I mean, plane dealers, I mean, all newspapers are getting beat up. So it was like uh, the last of a dying breed. Okay. How did your mom and dad meet then? Did, how did that old, old Italian neighborhood? Okay. Mountain. So it was just like by chance that you're, they yeah. didn't, Oh, Hey, I got a daughter. I'll introduce you to. It wasn't anything like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It wasn't like your dad 
<laughs> met your mom through your grandpa at the plane dealer. It wasn't like that. No, no. Okay. That, you get my point. Like I was like, it wait, it wasn't like a the- dowry or something like that. <laughs> dowry. I haven't like, heard that word in years. Yeah, I know. Oh God. Jared. I like, I can talk to this guy all the time. I, I know I got a million questions, but it, it, it's, uh, it, I think we're good, man. <laughs> we have to have, do it again. We'll have to do it again. I think. Charlie, do you think we got a good enough? Uh, do, is there anything else you want to talk about the event, uh, defensive duels, or I think the big thing that I want you guys to know is I'm trying to film every match. Um, what is there? Four rounds of wrestling, or six rounds of wrestling, or five? What is there? I think it's five. I think is it is it two pools? Two pools of six, probably. Bracket. No, there's got four. It. Four pools of three. Oh. Four pools of three, I think. And then you place them. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a gold and a silver, probably. Yeah. And a tin and a copper and whatever. I don't know what it is. Yeah, tin, copper, uh, 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 aluminum. Yeah. I don't know. Shout out to Bill. Um, I'm trying to film all the matches, so Bill Mazer called me, and he was he was super pumped. And I'm trying to video every match. He wanted to know where they were going to be. I'm like, well, they're free on YouTube. Yeah. That's where I'm putting everything. It's just going on my YouTube, and it's free, and – and then I'll commentate probably the finals and the good semifinals or whatever. You're like, hey, Zub, commentate this match. I'll do it. And then are we going to have a backdrop there? Like like you guys have had a backdrop in the past yeah, at the weigh-in. I mean, maybe we'll, we'll set one up um, here and we could kind of show off the facility too. Because if we're yeah. doing weigh-ins here, we can do some of that stuff and then we'll bring it. I don't know. Like we'll have to see what kind of access we have. Hopefully Jared gives us the, uh, the 411 because he's having an event there the weekend before. Yeah, this weekend. Yeah, yeah this Sunday. Hey, and- and yeah, I'm going to be there Sunday. Make sure that you guys want me at the weigh-ins, right? Or do you need to run it by guy or should I just come to the weigh-ins? Yeah, weigh-ins will be good. Okay. For sure. So I'll be at weigh-ins and do the stuff I've done the last couple of years with weigh-ins and yeah. make the and event coaches, special. I mean, you got some awesome coaches that are coaching these teams. I think their stories and perspective and all that stuff super important too. Yeah. I mean, dude, I interviewed Tommy Goff at the, I know. At the weigh-in last year. Yeah, it's crazy. Life is fleeting, man. It's a fragile, fleeting thing. It blows my mind. Yeah. Freaking blows my mind. So I'm good, Jared. You good? You good, Charlie? 